Good evening to all the attendees uh, today. Thank you for joining the Knowledge at KPD Admissions 101 workshop series. We have two esteemed panelists today who are joining us uh, for the session and their um, topic for the day is going to be exploring colleges off the beaten path, not coastal, not New York, not Los Angeles and not Boston. And it's my honor to have you introduced to the two esteemed panelists who are here today. To begin with, we have Mr. Nathan Jones from Westminster College, uh, Salt Lake City. Thank you for that, Nathan. And we also have another very esteemed panelist, Mr. Logan Gorby from Kansas State University, Manhattan, Kansas. And they're going to be sharing with you some very important points as to why we should uh, be open to looking at institutions who are off the well-known path because these institutions offer such, uh, 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 such great educational programs and career options that I know all of you, um, you know, when we had sent out these emails have uh, participated and uh, thank you for joining us today. So um, just to walk the attendees today, whoever's attending the session, we're gonna be having a 60 minute, um, 60 minute session. The first 30 minutes, the, uh, the, uh, the, the empowered panelists are going to be sharing with us, um, you know, about the topic and, you know, more information of not only uh, about the colleges, but and also the second 30 minutes is going to be a lot more about their colleges. And then we're going to be having a quick poll in the middle. So please do uh, uh, look out for that. And without further ado, I'm going to be handing over the stage and the microphone and uh, muting myself. Uh, to Mr. Nathan Jones and Mr. Logan Gobby. So please do welcome them. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you, Logan. Great. So Logan, um, were you able to send out the email yesterday? No, I wasn't able to. Um, I had a little bit of a health Push. issue. Um, so <laughs> I apologize for that. No worries. Um, well, first I'd like to say that both Logan and I have been to India multiple times. I think uh, at least six years for myself, Logan, I think five, is that right? And yeah, uh, right. go ahead. No, go ahead. And uh, so anyway, but it doesn't matter if we're in India or um, Bangladesh or if we're in like somewhere in Southeast Asia, like Taiwan. Uh, a lot of times when we're doing uh, high school presentations, nobody's heard of Kansas and nobody's heard of Utah. So uh, it's really exciting to present this topic today because um, on the next slide, Kunal, uh, they'll see uh, some things that are uh, probably should you should resonate with that you should uh, know where they're located. So obviously on the left-hand side, we have the, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is in San Francisco, and Starbucks is located in uh, Seattle, Washington. It's a, an international brand, right? Uh, you have them everywhere in the world. Um, Unfortunately, we lost Kobe Bryant from Los Angeles, but now we have uh, LeBron James, which is pictured originally from Ohio, that's now with the Lakers. Uh, you have the city, the Times Square of New York City in the top right-hand side. Uh, you have Disney World, which is you know where a lot of people have visited uh, when they come to the US. You have the US Capitol, which is in Washington, DC. It's on the coast, as well as, I'm not sure if you recognize the two gentlemen that there at the bottom, they were two previous presidents of uh, the United States, uh, George W. Bush, Bush and uh, the other uh, George Sr. Bush. So anyway, um, these are kind of the places that people kind of recognize and they all happen to be coastal places, uh, minus I guess uh, LeBron James in, in Ohio. But you know, these are places, there are, there's a whole West in the Midwest that kind of gets over, uh, overlooked as well as the states that are not coastal. So one of the reasons for um, doing this presentation is just to bring some more attention to these. Uh, there's over 25, uh, 30 states that are not on the coast. Um, so that represents uh, almost two thirds of the United States is not located on the coast of the United States. They just happen to be some of the largest cities, um, but there are small cities and towns uh, like Salt Lake City and uh, as well as Manhattan, Kansas that have a really great environment uh, for a college education. And, um, uh, you know, Westminster is a small private liberal arts college. We're the only small private liberal arts college in the whole state of Utah. And then uh, Kansas State's obviously a large 
uh, public research, tier one research university. So, yeah. Do you want to continue forward there, Logan? Um, yeah, on to the next slide. Yeah. Yes. Slide. Yeah, so, so we, we have, have a, sorry, we have a few videos here um, that kind of represent what what life in the Midwest and in the like the Mountain West region is like. So, um, Kunal, if you wanted to pick one of those for it to play, sure. Which one would you want me to pick? The first one? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so let's play the first one, and let's go to the safari video. And we also talk about the K State family and. to like 40 seconds in or something. This oh. is pretty cool. We're in the Midwest, we are off the beaten path. Um, we still are able to offer that large university experience with everything from division one athletics to um, a Formula One racing car uh, or Formula racing car as well. So I mean, like, there's a lot of really good opportunities that can happen in the in the Midwest and the Mountain West region. Um, and I think one of the things that's often overlooked with that is that we um, that we're able to offer these large campus experiences because we have the lower cost of living in most places. So we're really able to um, across the Midwest and the Mountain West, not just K State in general. Um, but we're really able to kind of offer a large university experience or bigger university experiences because we have more space and we have more um, more affordable cost of living and whatnot as well. So I, th I thought that was a really good video to showcase that. Great. So Kunal, if you'd click on the Sugar House one, it's kind of shows the neighborhood in which uh, Westminster College is located. Would be more than happy. It would be a pleasure. Thank you. In fact, uh, Westminster is actually in the video. I think this is the, another key of the state. Tis not in forest, nor yet in dell. Ever it holds me with magic spell. I think of these on the modern. So I'm going to cancel that and go back to the um, presentation here. Just one second, sorry. We've only had one practice, everyone, so we apologize yeah. for the technical difficulties. But we got to see two Kansas State here. We'll get to see a couple of uh, Westminster. Are you all able to see the presentation now? Yep. Yes. OK. Go ahead. So do you want me to play the third video? Yes, please. Um, Make sure this one is on Westminster. <laughs> Another K-State video. <laughs> it's quite a <laughs> <on> purpose. <laughs> um, here. You're doing great, Kunal. Don't worry. And I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Can you guys see the presentation? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Alexander yeah. Lee Davis. I apologize. Sorry. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Uh, we can so see the wait, slide in the US. Okay, just one second. Uh, I'm sorry, can you see it now? 
Okay, so do you want me to play the fourth video? Yeah. Uh, Logan, can you push it? Is not in force, nor yet in doubt. Ever it holds me with magic spell. Think of these. I'm a mod. Probably just go back to the present. Yeah. These videos yeah. Will work. yeah, we can get through some of the other videos later. That's fine. Um, My apologies okay. for that. All right. Okay, so we're going to go back into the presentation, everyone. Uh, I hope you all can hear me and put myself We can on. hear you. Okay, thank you. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, next slide. Thank you. Okay. Yes, next slide. All right, go ahead, Logan. Sorry. All right, so um, we wanted to um, go over, so maybe if you all could put in the chat or um, somewhere, the what are some good stereotypes that you've heard of the Utah, of the Utah and Midwest regions? Um, uh, so we kind of want to get an idea out there. So we have some ideas ourselves, obviously, um, that we'll have on the next slide, but we wanted to get some ideas from you all of what you potentially think. Um, what are some of the good stereotypes of folks from, uh, from these regions or that just the regions when you first think of them, um, what are the initial kind of things that come to your mind? Okay, so would you like me to run a poll? Or, okay, I think to the attendees, uh, if you could kindly uh, put your answers in the Q&A section, I think that'll be easier for everyone as long as Yeah, give them, a, give them like a minute to write things, you know, that'd be great. Just like your interpretation or what you know of the Midwest, and the Western United States, like kind of what your thoughts are. Yeah. What yeah. you've heard. One that says American food. American food. <laughs> Anybody else? That's good. Countryside. Yes. It is a beautiful countryside. Well, those are great answers. If folks want to continue putting stuff in there, um, I think those are um, those are great responses. We have American food and countryside in there. Um, so Kunal, if you want to go to the next slide, then. All right, so these are kind of some of the things and I think they go along pretty well with what you all said, especially the countryside one. Um, um, the photo here in the upper uh, left hand corner is of your traditional wheat field across Kansas. It has very, we have very picturesque um, uh, scenery and whatnot, even though Kansas kind of has a, a, a stereotype or the reputation of being incredibly flat, being incredibly plain. Um, we are in the plain state, but we have some really beautiful rolling hills. We have some gorgeous um, sunflower fields and wheat fields. Um, and of course we have the, the Kansas City Chiefs, the current Super Bowl champions. So it's not just a complete cultural or like uh, landscape wasteland um, in the Midwest region. Uh, there's a lot to actually do and see. Um, and I'll let Nathan kind of take over and talk about more about the Utah Mountain West region. Yes, yeah, so you can see the snow uh, capped mountains there in the top middle picture and uh, they have lots of ski snowboarding results, resorts in the wintertime and in the summer it makes for some really amazing hiking 
uh, the temperatures in the Valley of Salt Lake get into the 30s, uh, upper, you know, you know, lower mid 30s in the summertime and uh, Celsius. And then, um, you know, people go up into the mountains to get into like the, like around 28 degrees would be the maximum temperature. And it's only 30 minutes from campus. You can drive and you can be in a maximum of 28 degrees uh, Celsius for a daytime high when you get up into the mountains. So it's a, it's a nice relief to get up there to go hiking and enjoy some of the scenery, the lakes and things. And then you have um, down below, about three hours south of uh, Salt Lake City are the five national parks. Um, and you can see it's very different geography there. It's a uh, very red sandstone um, that's, that's there. And um, it's really amazing. I actually went there two weekends ago and I had an amazing time getting to take pictures and it's very scenic. And of course, uh, we have an international basketball uh, player on our Utah Jazz, Rudy Gobert. He's one of the team captains for the Utah Jazz. And so we do have a professional basketball also in Salt Lake City. And professional soccer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, if you want to go to the next slide. some more responses. OK, we have some more responses. Yeah. And the food is amazing. We, we've. Uh, We've got, I know in uh, Kansas, they have Kansas City barbecue and the ribs are really special there. <laughs> and uh, in Utah, we've got, you know, a lot of different diverse foods uh, within the city, not just American food, but uh, Indian food. We actually have a large uh, Nepalese population. So we have Nepal, you know, Nepalese restaurants, we've got Thai restaurants, you know, anything you can think of, uh, Korean, um, we have Chinese hot pot, we have Korean barbecue, all those different types of things. Um, bubble tea. So. And then blues music, folk music, yeah, there's that. And um, Salt Lake City is, is well renowned for having like a lot of uh, international uh, concerts and things like that. They really love to rock and party here in Utah. So uh, we have lots of different international um, music festivals that happen uh, in the city. Perfect. Now you want to go to the next slide there? So we have some more videos. Um, uh, maybe... You can skip that first one. We've seen that one, but the rest of them, I double checked. They're all hyperlinked correctly. Okay, great. So just click on any of the other three. Welcome to Utah. Um, yeah, maybe focus on the two Utah ones first since we haven't seen any of those yet. Sure. Just kindly okay. give me one second. So second no one, right? So, yeah, that one. Perfect. Okay, so second one, as you said, be on your screen. Welcome to Utah. Our stunning state is known for its world-class skiing and snowboarding resorts, spectacular red rock deserts, and is one of the nation's best states for business. Host of the 2002 Winter Olympic Games, Utah boasts a panorama of recreation and culture. From professional sports teams such as the Utah Jazz and Real Salt Lake, performance powerhouses such as the Utah Symphony, Ballet West, and Utah Opera, exceptional art galleries and concert venues, to award-winning restaurants and a lively nightlife scene, Utah showcases a limitless variety of activities and entertainment. Salt Lake City's airport is just 15 minutes from most Salt Lake neighborhoods and 40 minutes from Park City. In the summer, Utah has it all when it comes to hiking, golf, mountain biking, backpacking, camping, fishing, boating, river rafting, rock climbing, and more. Home to the mighty five national parks, countless lakes and reservoirs, and some of the most scenic public and private golf courses in the country, many of which are championship designated. There is something for everyone during the summer in Utah. Park City alone boasts over 400 continuous miles of trails, which span two resorts, and has been awarded the highest International Mountain Biking Association Gold Level Ride Center designation. In the winter, locals and visitors alike enjoy the greatest snow on earth at Utah's 14 world-class ski resorts. 
from Park City Mountain, the largest ski and snowboard resort in the United States, to Deer Valley Resort, which has been ranked the number one resort by Ski Magazine six times, to Snowbird, which features 3,240 vertical feet between the base and the summit. Utah has a resort for everyone. From the Wasatch Front cities of Ogden, Bountiful, Salt Lake, and South Jordan, to the Wasatch back communities of Park City, Heber, and Camas. There's a place for everyone in Utah. Live here, work here, play here. Contact your Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Utah Properties Professional for the current market information on our exceptional state. So as you can see, I kind of stole that from uh, the real, local real estate company, but it shows uh, all of uh, the area in which we're located. Uh, and I did talk about the beautiful national park. So you know, if you want to click on the Mighty Five National Parks, it's just a minute long. That one, yeah. Sure, I'll just have that ready for you. Great. While we're working on that, um, our next section is going to be talking about the negative stereotypes. Um, so if you all want to get ready and kind of start thinking about some of those negative stereotypes. No spot I love for well. Tis not in forest, nor yet in dell. Ever it holds me with magic spell. I think of these. Carry thy banner high. Long, long, may thy colors fly. Loyal to thee, thy children will swell the pride. Just give me one moment. I have to um, cancel it. If it doesn't play. Um, and um, I hope you all can see the presentation, everybody. Thank you. You can go on to the next slide. Yeah. So uh, the question attendees is what are some bad stereotypes of the Midwest and West? So, so I think we have one here about diversity, um, about not being as diverse. Um, and then also we have a question about sharing information about campus life. Definitely we'll get to that for sure. You remind us to ask that question. Do, do any of you have any other um, bad stereotypes of uh, the West besides being less diverse? You did hit on one of the things that we were planning to talk about. Yeah, we can just give everyone maybe a minute because sometimes these things take time to come. Yeah, so right. I'll just wait for, to the attendees, I'll uh, wait for another 30 seconds if you could kindly lodge your uh, things. Something uh, bad that you might have a stereotype about, you know, um, you know, when uh, when you think about the Midwest and the West. Yeah, international connectivity is one. It's a great one. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we can we can stop the poll for now, right? And we can move yeah. ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I can kind of talk about some of the Kansas stuff here. So people think that um, it's really just kind of a cow town. Um, in fact, I was uh, at a college fair at one point in time, um, a handful of years ago, and someone called uh, K-State a cow college, um, which is the first time I'd heard that, um, the, being in the Midwest and whatnot. But it's um, truly, it is a, a like, in all honesty, this was actually um, a picture taken from a K State from K State campus, so it is true in some sense. But um, we do have a very large um, agricultural um, aspect to our education here at K State. But um, another bad stereotype is that people assume that everything is just kind of a 
um, a barren wasteland and um, tornadoes come through on a daily basis. Um, I haven't, I've lived in Kansas my entire life and um, in the past five years, granted I've been gone with this job a lot, but I haven't seen a tornado in the last five years. Um, so that's definitely a positive thing. Um, and um, fortunately here in Manhattan, we're actually down in a valley. Um, so we're in the Flint Hills region and we're down in a valley. So um, tornadoes generally don't actually affect this region because of the way that the pressure systems work. Um, when the tornado comes through, it just goes right over the top of Manhattan and goes out into those more um, rural areas. So uh, even though there are tornadoes, yes, but they're definitely not um, the problem that people sometimes perceive them to be. And uh, some stereotypes of uh, Utah are, um, you see all the snow and that we're snowy states. That's also true for the Midwest, um, is that there's a lot of snow there. And um, that happens to be the case uh, for Salt Lake. We actually are located in the valley. And so it's kind of like a desert-like climate. And um, so it's, it's hot, it's really hot in the summer in the valley where we're located, Salt Lake City but in the mountains it's cooler. And so the same thing kind of happens in the winter time, except there's a lot more moisture that's in the air in the winter time. So if it's, if it's like 15 degrees, uh, you know, or, or eight degrees Celsius here in the valley uh, during the winter time, it's, it can be zero and below zero up in the mountains because you're literally climbing, um, uh, I think of the equivalent, you're, you're climbing a mile high. Um, the city itself is, is about almost a mile high and then you're climbing another mile and it's only a half an hour away. You're climbing up to get to uh, these amazing ski resorts. So there's amazing snow and powder that kind of gets fed from the Great Salt Lake. And so they get pounded up in the mountains, but in the valley, we can have a bright sunny day and it'd be snowing up in the mountains. So it's a really unique thing um, where we're at as far as the temperature is a lot more mild and we do get cold, you know, definitely get cold days and we do get snow here in Utah and the valley, but it's mostly up in the mountains and they get lots of snow up in the mountains. So um, there's no real reason to go up there unless you're really wanting to go skiing in the winter time um, or snowboarding. Um, and then we have a large uh, religious uh, group of uh, uh, Christians that are called LDS. Um, they're also known as Mormons. And um, so a lot of people think that, you know, the Midwest and the West is, uh, you know, primarily white. And there are large populations of uh, primarily white people in this region, in these regions. But we also have a lot of diversity as well. And what I wanted to say is that for the LDS population and also about being international friendly, um, these, uh, this group of uh, Christian organization, they actually travel the world um, year round every year. Uh, trying to preach about their particular uh, style of Christianity. And um, so they're very welcoming to international people that come to our city because they've lived abroad. Uh, they usually have to serve like a year's mission as a part of their, after their college education, they usually, or during their college education, they usually serve one year helping serve a local community internationally. And, um, you know, with making wells in very rural areas or helping with schools or uh, education systems and, and different things when they're in other country. So they're kind of helping out local communities around the world. So when we have international people come here, they're very welcoming to international people that come to our city. And one of my best friends that I work with here at work is LDS. And I'm telling you, he's just a really great guy. He's funny, he's hilarious, so he makes me laugh every day. Um, so anyway, they're really great people. They're very clean living people, so they don't drink alcohol and they uh, don't do drugs. Um, so there's a lot of uh, clean, healthy people that, are, that make up the LDS population. So anyway, that tells you a little bit more about uh, Do you want me to go to the next slide? Sure. Okay, before we go there, I know there were a few comments about uh, less diversity or any, any points that you would like to share. I think there was one about international connectivity or you know, something of that nature. And I can see two or three people have posted about that, I guess, um, you know. So can you just share a little bit points? Logan, Nathan, if you'd like to come forward and just speak briefly, and of course, we'll take it forward. Or would you like me to proceed? No. Uh, okay. If you go to the next one, I think we address it on the next slide, actually, too. Oh, okay. Um, 
So yeah, Nathan, do you want to start? Or do you want me to start? Yeah, I was just going to say uh, we have uh, we, we have two thousand total students at Westminster College, so it's a much smaller. Uh, it's the only small liberal arts college, like I said, in Utah, um, and we have just over a hundred international students in total. Um, but they represent forty different countries, so we have uh, a lot of diversity among different countries. And then, of course, we have uh, you know Asian and Hispanic uh, students that are also uh, here at Westminster College that represent like Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans that are uh, now living here in the U.S. So, um, so yeah, I would say that the diversity has been, you know, on the rise. Utah is also one of the fastest growing states in the United States and has been for the last 10 years. We rank in the top five for fastest growing states in the U.S. So that's a little known fact that most people don't realize. And we have a lot of IT businesses that are coming in. We can talk more about that later. And then Kansas State has a large international population. Yeah, so we have about um, probably of the Manhattan community, which includes the K-State community and like the local community, probably 10 to 15% of the population is international um, because of the university. So over half the population within the city of Manhattan is directly affiliated to the university. And um, so that like the, the diversity numbers are really, really impacted by the university here. So we're a very typical kind of American college town and that Amer American college experience um, and international students and the internationalization and, and the diversity they bring to campus is definitely part of that. So we have um, a pretty good, uh, even though we're in the Midwest and across the state, yes, we are very, um, homogenous in general, but um, as far as the university in Manhattan goes, um, and kind of this little stretch of the of the um, interstate that we're on that links um, Kansas State University, the University of Kansas, and the Kansas City area um, all together is a pretty, um, a pretty diverse region of the world just because of the large universities that we have here and um, the large research facilities that we, that we operate within the region as well. Um, so there's a lot of really great, um, uh, great things to be seen um, within the region and a lot of great um, cultural food, ethnic food, uh, that sort of stuff available there as well. Um, but definitely some of the stuff that um, you all touched on with the bad closed mindedness and lack of diversity are things that we understand are um, limitations of our region. But um, I think one of the cool things that um, for me is that we um, campuses really can change the diversity of an environment and just physically simply by K-State being here in Manhattan, um, it truly has changed the diversity and the offerings and the um, just everything that happens here in Manhattan is, is different because Kansas State University thing. It's, it, it's really cool to see the, um, everything that people are able to bring to the table here in Manhattan. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Just give me one moment. Thank you. I just wanted to say that there's, you know, everything that you would have in like the larger cities, you would also like have in, in our city. We both have zoos in our city. Uh, we have an aquarium here in Salt Lake. We have multiple shopping malls. Uh, there's lots of breweries and wineries that are uh, in our cities. Uh, and we already talked about the, rec the recreational things, the landscapes, the lower cost of living is significant. I mean, New York City, Boston, and Miami, and LA are probably like the four most expensive places to live in America. And, you know, that, that factors into your total cost of attendance. So um, that's another reason to take a little bit uh, deeper look at the Midwest and the West, Utah, Kansas. Um, and then we do have like a lot of really great high tech jobs here. You've heard of Silicon Valley in California. We have something called the Silicon Slopes here in Salt Lake City. And so it's a high tech corridor. We have like a lot of startup companies, uh, Google, uh, Amazon, all the big name companies are actually here. American Express are here in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And so those are really great opportunities for internships while you're student. So yeah. keep going, you know. Okay. All right, so here we have a handful of videos just kind of cap it off again to kind of showcase our campuses and the regions that we come from. 
Um, but while that's going, um, if you all want to write into the Q&A specific questions that you have, I know that we've kind of touched on a lot of things, but if there's anything that you'd like us to go deeper on, uh, we'd be more than happy to answer any specific questions. I know we had one in there about talking about campus life on, um, on each of our campuses and what, that, and what that student experience will be like. So we're more than happy to answer those questions as well. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we have an, a question here. Um, do we want to do the video or do you just want to go into Q&A, Nathan? Why don't you go into Q&A if we have time, we'll go back to the videos. Perfect, yeah. So um, it looks like we have a question here about um, uh, learning more about the international students on your campus. So um, I can touch on that briefly and then I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Nathan to have him answer that question. Here at K-State, we have um, about a little over 1,700 international students from 105 countries around the world. Um, so we are very lucky to be as diverse as we are, um, particularly when you consider the region that we're, that we're in. And um, the international student experience is a pretty robust one here at K-State. So we have um, over 500 clubs and organizations that students can start or join. And um, we really make sure that students have a great experience. Everything from welcoming students to the airport. So I, myself, and my colleagues in, in the admissions office, we, um, for the two weeks leading up to the start of every semester, are the week before orientation and the week before that. Um, we go to the airport for every flight that comes in. We do have a regional airport that's directly linked to um, Dallas and Chicago. So it's pretty easy to get here from anywhere in the world because those are two of the largest hubs within, um, especially the Midwest, probably um, two of the five largest hubs in the, in the US in general. And um, so yeah, we're a very well connected community. And so uh, this international student experience starts from the airport. So we go out there, we pick students up from the airport, we get them to their residence hall or their apartment here in Manhattan or a, a hotel if they don't have a place to stay or if they haven't arranged a place to stay quite yet. Um, so we really make sure that students have a great opportunity while they're here on campus. And then we have an entire week of orientation um, that's specifically dedicated to international students, kind of helping them get acclimated, get them um, aware of the resources that we have on campus for them, um, get their student ID, all that sort of stuff that, um, that sometimes we take for granted a little bit that um, we're like, oh, that's just normal things. Those are things that happen. But as an international student, we sometimes take for granted that they haven't had that experience yet. So we um, kind of walk them through that in the first couple of weeks of campus um, of them being on campus here. That's great. Yeah, we also have the uh, airport pickup and we have a, a day for international student orientation. And we have our international students join our regular uh, American students uh, for the orientation for the following two or three days so they get acclimated to the whole campus community and are not segregated to just being international. But we have to touch on some international things. Uh, so that's why we keep one day for that. Um, we are very friendly to uh, people from all walks of life. We have the LGBTQ community here. So we're very accepting. And you might've also heard that you know our states are very conservative but on college campuses, they tend to be very liberal. And uh, that would be the case for uh, at least Westminster College, where the most liberal college amongst the whole state college system that's here, we're the only private liberal arts college. So we're very accepting of people from all walks of life. And although we only have 100 international students, the good news is that you're gonna be very popular on our campus because we don't have as many international students. So I would say that you're gonna be a very popular person on campus. People are gonna know who you are and know your name and everything. And because we're such a small campus community, you know, our classes are very small. They're even gonna be smaller this fall because of COVID-19. We're gonna do a lot of uh, distancing um, from people. So we're, our classrooms are gonna be even smaller than what they currently are. So, um, so that's kind of one of the benefits of a small college campus is that there's lots of uh, job opportunities on campus. You can work up to 20 hours per week and a lot of our international students do that. I had a freshman this year from South Africa that actually got a job uh, working for what's called the Great Salt Lake Institute and that's a institute for research that's hosted by Westminster College on the Great Salt Lake and so they do research of the environment uh, and how it's being affected um, by different pollutants and things. Uh, her research was actually she noticed that there was tar which is a natural thing that's, that was pooling up from uh, the Great Salt Lake. And so the US Geological Society wanted to uh, not only met, have her measure that, but also measure water that's pooling up naturally from the Great Salt Lake as well. She got funded and she actually got, uh, she got a, a promotion to have a research uh, published as a first year student. So undergraduate research opportunities are also there. 
And I know international students that work in our mail room. We have international students that work for us in our international admissions office. We have students that work in the dining hall and our uh, recreation facilities that are on campus. So there's a lot of ways for international students to get involved in what else is happening. We have international student clubs and organizations on campus. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's a great community for international students. So um, can, you, can, you, can you share um, maybe the make your way one, which kind of shows a little bit. Of sure, the, the one on the bottom right? Yes, please. Okay. Things don't fall into place. They take root where you choose to dig. It's drive and diligence, power and spirit, nerve and heart. It's about effort, strength, intent, risk and unwavering resolve. So leave your bubble, find your element, make your way. Clear a path for one, for some, for many. This is Westminster College, where success comes to those who don't rely on chance. You claim a life of consequence, where opportunity is really just energy and direction, and you. That's great. We have a few more. Uh, uh, Logan, did you want to show another one of your campus? Or? Uh, no, I'm good. We have about six questions in here that we could um, run through quickly. Um, so it looks like. Um, we both have computer science and information technology on our yep. campus. Um, we do not offer master's degrees, just bachelor's degree here, here at Westminster College. But like I mentioned before, the Silicon Slopes has some really great opportunities. Uh, for internships and you can work off campus doing what's called CPT curricular practical training so if it's related to your major you can actually work uh, in that field and then after you finish after you graduate you're still on your student visa but you can study up to uh, three years because it's science technology uh, related um, so Logan and you can talk about what you guys have master's and PhDs in computer <coughs> excuse me uh, yeah, we have um, bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in computer science and IT. We um, have specializations when, within all of those areas as well. So if the student's going for their bachelor's degree in computer science, they can specialize in cybersecurity or artificial intelligence, um, or they could do a separate major in computer engineering, which focuses more on the hardware side of things um, and like that network infrastructure, the connectivity sort of things. Um, so there's a lot of really good opportunities to study um, IT and whatnot. Um, here at K-State, um, in, including our management information system. So it's kind of a hybrid between um, a business degree and that um, IT degree. So it's really working, focusing on the individual who wants to work within an IT department, probably within a large corporation or something like that, working on software development or software installation sort of stuff. Um, so it does a, a nice job of bridging the gap between those two areas. Um, and I think that's one thing K-State does really well because we also have a degree program that's a, um, a Kind of a bridge between our management program and our um, uh, computer science program that's data analytics or data science heavy um, so it, it again falls in that stem that nathan was talking about but stem qualification that nathan was talking about so there's a lot of really great ways to study it and that list is just going to continue to grow as we continue to get more and more um, technological as a as a world i would say um, all right and then the next question is Kind of about like our student to faculty ratio and that's a great question um, but a better question to ask is actually average class size because um, you know you know in a lot of places they have like a lot of research faculty and teaching faculty at, at Westminster 100% of our uh, professors are teaching although some of them do research as well especially in the science related areas of computer science math uh, the technology fields all the physical sciences as well um, so our, our average uh, class size is about 15 students in the classroom and our student teacher ratio I think is eight to one and that would be more more like uh, an upperclassman 
type of class, meaning like your junior or senior year, you could have as few as maybe eight students in a class um, if you were in the upper levels of class courses. And Logan? Um, yeah, for us, our um, student to faculty ratio is 18 to 1, and our average class size is about 21. Um, our um, with the university our size, it's almost impossible. We have um, a little over 22,000 students. It's impossible to not have some of those large lecture halls. Um, obviously this fall um, and this coming spring, that will look a lot differently with, with COVID-19 as we take social, social distancing into account. Um, but yeah, you'll have some, like students will have those larger lecture halls during their first year. Um, but in my last year here at K-State during my undergraduate, um, I never had any more than eight students in any of my classes. So it definitely does kind of narrow down pretty quickly across your four years here at the university. It's just a matter of um, getting out of those larger, those general education classes that a majority of the, the campus um, the campus population has to take. Um, and once you start getting into more of those major specific or even like college specific classes, um, then it narrows down pretty quickly. And I would say the average um, for those classes is going to be around um, 25 to 30. And so making the overall average about 21 or so. Great. Hey, Logan, we have about five more minutes and two of the uh, remaining questions are talking about like popular majors and minors for international students. So do you want to take that first and then I'll follow up? Yes. Um, so popular majors here at K-State, the most common major for a student to choose is um, engineering. Um, uh, in particular, mechanical engineering within that, we have a lot of specializations that students can choose within the mechanical program. Um, so most of them are coming here for like an aerospace engineering degree. Um, that's a specialization. So their transcript still says mechanical engineering, but they have that specialization notated on their transcript. Um, and then we also have a handful of international students that um, are in our mechanical program because they're doing a dual degree in mechanical and nuclear engineering. Um, so we're one of the only, uh, we're one of 25 universities, um, sorry, 24 universities, 25 reactors um, that have a nuclear reactor on our campus. Um, so students can become nuclear certified and they can um, get that certification, even international students. Um, there's no barriers to um, citizenship with the exception of North Korea and Iran. Um, so if you have students from anywhere in the world other than those two locations, um, they can definitely come and study nuclear engineering here at K-State. Um, outside of engineering, um, probably the second most popular is business, and then the third would be our aviation programs with our unmanned aircraft systems like drone programs and um, our professional pilot program as well. Right, and uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question because I know at large universities you have a lot of strong uh, programs and things like that. Uh, Westminster also has a lot of really strong majors and things. Uh, I would say for international students um, specifically, uh, the STEM areas because they're trying to build infrastructure in their country. So science, technology, uh, engineering, math. We, we have engineering, but it's only like a, it's a three plus two where you do all your prerequisites for engineering uh, at Westminster. So you would do all your physics, math, all your liberal arts types of classes, all your prerequisite courses. Uh, and then you would do your engineering at K-State or um, University of Southern California, which is where we have an affiliation with Washington. University of St. Louis, we have an affiliation with. So it would be for someone, I would say if you know engineering is what you want to do, probably don't choose Westminster for that. Maybe you could look at K-State for that. But um, if you have an idea that you're interested in engineering or computer science and you're not sure, then Westminster could be an option because we have a really great science major. And um, you, know, you could choose other majors as well. It's easy to major and minor in something else. Not so much for engineering, it's a little bit more difficult with engineering, unless it's within the engineering major itself, like uh, Logan was mentioning, aero and mechanical at the same time. So it, it's a little bit easier to double major if it's within the same academic major, like engineering, but it's, it's still very difficult because engineering is so specific, you have to take so many math, so many physics, so many engineering courses to get your degree. Uh, whereas most of the other majors allow for a lot more flexibility if you're a computer science major, um, you're obviously part of the Westminster core curriculum. You'll have to take two social science classes, um, two uh, laboratory science classes, which you would anyway for uh, computer science. You have to take like a religion philosophy type of course, and uh, you can choose. There's so many choices as far as classes that you get to make um, amongst your career, and you also get to choose when the classes happen. So you can either choose like Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, maybe you have three classes that meet on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and two classes that uh, meet on Tuesday and Thursday. So that would be your full schedule uh, for the semester. And then it could change 
drastically the next semester. Um, and uh, so other than that, we have a really good nursing program. A lot of our students do the pre-professional uh, programs as well for pre-law, pre-med, all those types of uh, areas as well. Um, it's very difficult as an international student to get to medical school. It's easier if you're a permanent resident or have family uh, residency uh, here in the US, um, but it's not impossible. It's, it's very difficult. There's about 50 US colleges that accept uh, uh, international students into their medical schools in the US. And then you can also look at Canada. Sorry, um, we answered all the questions. We got a couple more. There's about two more um, minutes. Looks like there's like maybe 10 or so left in here. So we can kind of just start running down. Um, so um, sports opportunities on campus. Um, so K-State, we're a division one sports, um, but if you're not, um, that usually means you have to be kind of a top athlete, like um, national collegiate team or um, pre-Olympic or junior Olympic level to qualify to participate in those athletics. But we do have club sports um, where you can, again, remain active, especially if you're um, a, a good high school player, you can remain active in sports there, competing against other universities across the country just with no scholarship attached. Um, and then we have intramural sports that, where you can play um, kind of competitively and friendly games against um, other people here at the university. And then there's the recreation complex where you can just kind of go in and um, play sports on your own uh, as well. To follow up with the, the question, can you double major and finish in four years? Yes, it's possible to do. You may have to take a sub, couple summer classes each summer for a couple years uh, to catch up because typically you need to take an additional 10 classes to get a double major, Does, if that makes sense. As long as you have the prerequisites for those higher level courses, um, it would take a minimum of 10 more classes usually to get a double major. But if you did a minor, it's like another six to eight classes. So it's a lot easier to do a major and a minor, but it can be done in, within four years. Um, One thing I would recommend, if you're interested in double majoring, look for dual majors. Those are kind of prepackaged programs universities have already put together. Um, so for us, like computer science and mathematics, it's just four extra classes for an entire extra degree program. So it's kind of a subtle difference, but dual major versus double major is, has a little bit of a difference there, um, at least from a K-State perspective, I should say. Correct. And also look into uh, four plus one bachelor's to master's degree programs that we offer because uh, I think in your sophomore or junior year, if you notify uh, your academic advisor that you're wanting to also complete a master's degree, instead of it taking two years, it can take one year uh, to finish your master's degree. But you have, that, you have to let the academic advisors know that, I guess, in your sophomore or junior year to make sure that your class schedule is, is set, set up for that. Um, so that can save you and your family a lot of money as well by doing a four plus one accelerated bachelor's to master's. Um, students can join all the different sports teams. A lot of us have a club sports, um, which is like intramural sports. So if you're played like basketball or soccer in high school and you want to do that here, that's probably the best way to go. Unless as Logan mentioned, you're like a, a really top athlete. We're division two. So we still offer uh, athletic scholarships, but it's usually partial uh, athletic scholarships. And then when you combine that with academic scholarships, uh, that can come up to about full tuition, depending on how, you know, how strong of an athlete you are um, and how you're ranked. Like if you're ranked nationally in golf or in India, then you might have a good chance of getting, you know, a, a golf scholarship here. Um, all right. Um, we have one final question here. I know we're a little bit over time, but I wanted to hit the, we had a question about tuition and living costs. Um, so I can tell you quickly here at K-State, the average cost of attendance for one full year um, or for one academic year is going to be between um, like thirty-nine dollars to $42,000 per year, all inclusive with your housing, meals, books, insurance, um, all that stuff that goes along with that. So everything should be included in that figure. Um, the reason there's a range is because it depends on the programs that you're in. So if you're going into like a biology program, it's gonna be closer to that $39,000 range. Or if you're going to an engineering program, they have a few additional technology fees and whatnot. So they're gonna be around that $42,000 range. But um, that is all inclusive of living costs and everything there as well. Right, and for Westminster Co College, um, don't get too shocked here because I <laughs> It's, it's a high number, but nobody pays the, the total amount that I'm going to share with you. So it's, it shows 54163 is our total cost of attendance for one year. But as I mentioned before, nobody pays that amount. Um, the, the 
very basic student. The student has a 3.0 GPA uh, that gets admitted to Westminster College. Um, <clears throat> no matter what your standardized test score, uh, SAT, ACT, TOEFL, IELTS, or we're now accepting Duolingo right now, um, you're going to minimally get like $9,000 off uh, of our total cost. And then uh, the scholarships go up to $24,000 off each year. So it depends on, you know, how you score on the standardized testing as well as your grade point average. I saw a question related to this, which was, do we uh, waive a TOEFL who completed the IV diploma? Um, unfortunately, we, we don't do that here at Westminster, but we do give you credits for your IV courses. If you typically score a four or five, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it goes up to seven. If you score a five or higher, typically on your IV exams, then you can actually receive academic credits for those courses. Um, but we do require some form of standardized testing just to get a, a benchmark for where you're at um, uh, test score wise. And typically students from India score really high on the SAT or ACT, so I wouldn't be too concerned uh, about taking those tests. Logan, do you wanna add anything to that? I saw another question about that um, A-levels uh, so A-levels, same thing. We give credits for A-level exams as well. Um, so typically, I think a C or considered a B uh, for, uh, in the U.S. for A-level results. So we would also give academic credits for any A-level testing. And we also give credits for, at Westminster for AS, Advanced Subsidiary Courses, as long as they're not the same subject. Ours is pretty similar. So we offer credit for um, A-level courses, mm -hmm. not AS level, but we do offer it for A-level courses. Um, and if you've taken uh, Cambridge English um, as an A-level subject, we can use that to waive an English proficiency requirement. Same with IB. If you've taken um, English A as um, an SL subject with a six or a seven or an HL subject with a four or above, we'll waive the English proficiency requirement. Or if you've done English B um, and you get a six or a seven as an HL, then we can go ahead and waive that English proficiency requirement there as well. Um, same with SAT and ACT scores. So we have a, a pretty robust um, English proficiency testing policy. So you can go through. There's quite a few different um, ways that you can prove English proficiency outside of submitting a TOEFL or an IELTS test. Um, and as Nathan mentioned, we're also um, accepting the Duolingo English test right now as well. We have a, a free application for admission. So um, if any of you are, have, haven't decided finally for this fall, we're still accepting applications. That's my uh, my plug, but if you're out for the next year, our application, I believe, should be live for 2021, <clears throat> both uh, either January entry or uh, August entry starting around the 1st of August. Uh, let's see. So we have a few questions left. I know that we're over time. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time today. So um, we can definitely continue answering the questions, but I don't want to run over on anyone's time here. So I think that's um, fine, Logan. Please take your time. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so we can, so I'll just kind of run down the list, start with the top one here. So can you share more information about campus life? So um, we started doing that a little bit. Let me know if you have any other questions, any specific questions about campus life. Um, we can definitely go over that a little bit more. But um, overall, I think that if you, if I were to kind of um, quickly sum up what K-State's campus life is like, is it's a very typical American college experience. Like that large public state school that um, Nathan's, Nathan was referencing earlier, um, that's very much the K-State experience is that you have all sorts of leadership opportunities. You have all sorts of opportunities to live on campus versus off campus. Um, and like I was talking about earlier, we're very much located in like an American college town. So we um, kind of offer that, that American college experience inside and outside of the classroom. So we kind of have this downtown area that's really just for students. Um, it's right next to campus. It's called Aggieville. And then we have our um, uh, kind of like we call it the adult downtown, um, which is where more faculty and staff kind of hang out and whatnot. Um, and that's a little bit like about a mile or so from campus. So um, we do offer a very kind of robust campus life experience inside and outside of the classroom. The Westminster College, as I mentioned, is located in the Sugar House District. It's it's the, really one of the nicest neighborhoods in, in all of Salt Lake City. And there are many nice neighborhoods throughout the city. It's a very safe city uh, to go and travel around. You can ride your bike day or night, anytime. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just a really great place. And so 
uh, our campus is is in the neighborhood basically it's in the sugar house neighborhood so there's a lot of public parks um there's liberty park there's uh oh gosh there's so many parks i can't think of them all but i played tennis and i played tennis in liberty park i played tennis in liberty park last night um there it's within walking distance the long walk probably about a half an hour to get to the downtown or you can just take a bus and it's free transportation throughout the whole uh state of utah with your student id so if you want to take a train or bus uh anywhere within the city it's it's very easy to do that um we also have above ground trams that, so they can take you around the city as well that way so again with your student id all the public transportation here is free and um so that being said what else um i'm just trying to to have you picture what life is like here at westminster so you know like the opportunity to be able to do an internship either on campus or off campus is, is great. The opportunity to have a part-time job is on campus, which can kind of help you with your spending money. You shouldn't look at that as a way to like reduce the total cost of your tuition, room, board, and fees. You would just think of it as a way to kind of like help you go on a date with someone or maybe go out with your friends for pizza or something like that uh, in the city. Um, Within about five minutes walking from our campus, there's a Chick-fil-A, there's uh, was like a popular American restaurant. They've got um, Nepalese restaurant within five minutes walking. There's uh, a kebab place, which is Middle Eastern cuisine. It's within five minutes. There's uh, so many different options, just like really close by to where we're at. And um, so yeah, it's, it's a great environment. And we're a part of the city too, so it's easy to get around the city. And so like Logan mentioned, it's, it's kind of like uh, the campus community rolled into the city. Other questions? Right. <clears throat> One about um, internships on campus. Um, it, said, it looks like uh, Nathan mentioned something about Amazon and Google. Yeah, other, well, those would be off campus, but on campus, um, we're actually, the president of uh, Westminster College hasn't enacted this yet, but she's planning on having every student that graduates in the near future, every student that graduates from Westminster to have an internship. That's gonna be one of our new platforms here at Westminster College, which is unique because no other college in the state of Utah will have that type of opportunity. So 90% um, of our students that graduate from Westminster are getting jobs or going to graduate school within five months of graduating from here. So, and a lot of the reason for that is because they're doing internships, not just on campus, but off campus as well, um, while they're here in multiple internships. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of the student work jobs, they're actually thinking about turning those into actual, actual internships. And um, so like paid internships uh, here on campus. So uh, that could be academic research, it could be uh, working in, you know the gems and things like that if it's aligned with your major um so there's a lot of different opportunities for internships again on or off campus logan can you speak to some other things on campus that students might be doing internships with yeah so we have a lot of internships that happen um particularly within the research areas um again being a large research university and um so kind of going off what Nathan mentioned earlier about the, um, the Silicon Slopes out in Utah. Um, here in Manhattan, we're considered the Silicon Valley of, bi of biodefense. Um, so we do a lot of research in biodefense and bioagriculture and biosecurity. Um, and in fact, by 2023, we will be the preeminent institution in the United States um, and arguably the world for bio, um, biosecurity and bioagricultural research. So um, everything from Ebola crises that happen, um, like the Ebola crisis that happened here in the 2010s and back in the 1980s, um, as well as like the coronavirus crisis that we're going through right now, um, all or pandemic, I should say, um, all of that sort of research is happening here at K-State. And typically it's students that are on internships that are, or that have an internship credit that are doing a lot of that research with their major professors here. Um, other internships that we offer, um, probably the most robust internships or the most numerous internships are those with our with the K-State Athletics Department. So everything from managers on the teams to athletic trainers to um, some like health aides and whatnot um, to assist those student athletes um, as they are, one, being 
students and also being athletes. So we have like the tutors in, within there as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities to get those internships on campus. Um, and it may not necessarily be the specific internship. It's not gonna necessarily be going to work in an office every day, but if you're looking to go into like, the health industries or physical therapy or something along those lines or the research fields, there's a lot of really great internship opportunities right here on our campus. Um, and then there's obviously um, internship opportunities in the Kansas City area and around town here in, in Wada as well. Um, so we have a question about scholarship opportunities for Indian students. Um, do we offer any assistantships? Um, so here at K-State, I can say we have scholarships that are renewable. I um, mean, you're automatically considered for all of our scholarships that we have once you're admitted to the university. So first we take a really quick look at your application to see um, if you're eligible for admission. And if you are, we'll take a second quick look to, look, um, to see which scholarships you may be eligible for. So here at K-State, you can earn up to $8,000 um, in uh, tuition scholarships that's renewable each year, plus an additional three dollars to $4,000 um, for your first year that comes from my office. And then there's usually about um, anywhere between one to $4,000 that students can earn um, as returning students from their department and from the International Student and Scholar Services. And another question related to that <clears throat> is, will admissions be more competitive next year for me because I am hearing many uh, current senior class students deferring? Um, I, I think that we don't, ha we don't have such a large international student population, so it's not gonna be uh, any more difficult to get admitted uh, next fall from, you know, from this fall to next fall. Um, so we're still wanting to uh, admit uh, a lot more international students than what we currently have. And so I don't see it being any more competitive uh, for next year than uh, this year. Similar, it's pretty same for K-State. Um, we have, as long as you meet our minimum um, admission requirements, you're gonna be eligible for admission. Um, but with that said, with students deferring, um, in particular, some of our really popular programs, like I mentioned earlier with mechanical engineering, they do have limits to the number of students they're able to accept in their program just because of space limitations. They just don't have enough seats available. Um, same with architecture. So some of those selective admission programs might be a little bit more difficult. Um, I would recommend if you are considering applying for a selective admission program here at K-State, like that mechanical engineering or an architecture program um, or an interior design here, then just apply early. I think that's your best chance at it. But as far as um, because other students are deferring, that's not a, an issue that we're necessarily concerning, concerned with. Um, as long as students meet that minimum eligibility requirement, they're going to be eligible for admission. It's just those selective programs do fill up a little bit quicker. Um, and that's not to say if you apply for a selective program and you don't get admitted to that program right away, then you'll be able to, um, you can start in a different degree program, still take classes that count towards that selective degree admission program, and then transfer into as an internal candidate from within the university. Um, and usually that's about like a 95% acceptance rate for students for there. So it's not um, that you're selling yourself short by um, kind of choosing a different path. It's just that this one year might be more competitive than others. Um, if I, that, that's a great question though. Yeah, another question, Logan, is would it be possible for you to share about uh, campus safety? So um, at Westminster College, um, you know, of the, both of our campuses, I don't think we have wall, I know we don't have walls that keep the, the local population of people outside of our campus. Anyone can walk freely around the neighborhood of Sugar House and it's a very safe neighborhood. So we don't have high walls, uh, like I've seen in other international cities where you kind of, you know, if you have an expensive home, you have to block it off from people coming. Um, but you do have to take the necessary precautions in your residence hall room. You know, it's smart if you're, if you're, you know, to lock your door behind you, just make sure you have your keys with you and things like that, because, you know, it's unfortunately, sometimes people steal things, you know, and you don't know if you're, you know, if your friends down the hall have some friend that, you know, is, is, likes to steal things, you know. So you just have to be take necessary precautions. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it happens a lot, but that's probably the most common uh, thing that happens is, is theft on campus, you know, leaving your, your bike unlocked. Because we do have a homeless population. I don't want to say it's like all 100% perfect here uh, in Salt Lake City. And so there are homeless people that sometimes walk through campus, but we do have campus safety there to make sure that they continue to move off campus and they're not staying on our campus uh, throughout the night or sleeping on campus. They can't do that um, here. Um, 
So it's not like you see homeless people on a, on a daily basis, but sometimes they're walking through. And um, so you'll see our campus police, they're usually on bike or they're in patrol cars walking around our campus. So it's very uh, easy to see them day or night. Um, and it, it's a very well-lit campus, so it's easy to walk around campus day or night and feel very, very safe. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like the safety situation here at Westminster. Oh, one last thing. We, we did have an earthquake <clears throat> and, a, and several aftershocks uh, here in Salt Lake City uh, this past spring. And so I experienced my, well, actually my second earthquake. I was in Costa Rica and I had my first earthquake there. But then this one was a little bit stronger than the one I experienced in Costa Rica. And um, it was frightening because the ground roared and made a weird sound. Uh, kind of like an airplane landing. And uh, then, you know, everything shook for, uh, it seemed like a really long time, but it was only about 10 seconds uh, in my apartment. And um, then the aftershocks were, were a little bit, you know, frightening, but then I kind of got used to them. Like, oh, that's a level four uh, aftershock. That's no big deal. Uh, that's a 3.5. I can, I can start to guess like what, what the next aftershock was gonna, gonna be like. But uh, it's probably been about a month since I've actually, or two months since I've actually felt one. So hopefully we're gonna be good for a while. But we do get message alerts to our phone um, that's uh, sent to us by Campus Safety. If anything's going on, if we're canceled for snow, a snow day, they'll notify us via text message. So you sign up for that when you do your orientation if you sign up for text message alerts. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so campus safety here at K-State, it's pretty similar to what Nathan was talking about at Westminster. Um, so here at K-State, like similar to them, we don't have, our campus isn't blocked off from the campus community or from the Manhattan community by any means. Um, it's a pretty open campus. Um, it is a walking campus though, so there's only a select few places. It's a pretty large campus across. So if you were to walk from one corner to the opposite corner, it would take you probably 35 to 40 minutes um, to get all the way across campus. So it is a pretty large campus and there's a couple of streets that you can drive on. But um, one thing that we did to make the campus safer just in general was that we did close it down and make it a walking and biking campus during the day. Um, so during the, during the school day when the most people are on campus, um, people generally aren't allowed to drive unless it's like an official K-State vehicle or something like that. Um, as far as other safety goes, we do have um, the blue light system here on campus. We also have um, what we call the um, Wildcat Walk program. Um, and so we have a program where, so we have our own K-State police force here within Manhattan as well. Um, so we have a K-State police officer will come meet you anywhere on campus and we'll walk with you up to two miles off campus or like two miles would be like maybe three and a half to four kilometers um, off campus. They'll take you to your house to, um, if you're like, studying late at the library or something like that and just for whatever reason don't feel comfortable walking home by yourself um, you can call that free service um, for all of our students uh, we also have like a safe ride program as well so where you can um, we have a free bus system that runs around um, during the day that you can use but it shuts off at a certain point in time um, and then we have our safe ride program where students can hop on a bus that k-state pays for um, to make sure they're they're able to get wherever they're going safely if they, maybe they've had too much to drink or something along those lines making sure that they're safe there as well so we have um, a lot of K uh, campus safety it's really integrated into kind of our core mission of what we do um, so one of the first things that you'll do when you're here on campus is you'll be introduced to a k-state police officer and kind of get more familiar with the services they offer um, and just kind of get more comfortable with speaking with an officer who is wearing a uniform and whatnot because um, we know oftentimes um, in different countries maybe people don't interact with police in the same way that we do here in the United States um, so we want to make sure that students have that comfort level when they're going and they're having those interactions with uh, with police officers uh, from there um, yeah, we have a question hey Kunal could you advance to the next slide um, that shows our email addresses Yes, kindly give me one moment. I'll just uh, do the screen share. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the another question is about, do we consider um, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th year grades? And yes, we do. Um, we realize that the grading is very difficult. Uh, is it the junior year, the 11th grade year? I can't remember which year. They do a really harsh grading uh, for Indian students. I think it's in the grade 10 or grade 11. Okay. But <clears throat> we realize that and we take all that into consideration. 
um, when reviewing the application. And a lot of times what we'll look at for grade 12 is your predicted uh, IB or A level or um, your first semester CBSE uh, sort of grades uh, to make an admissions decision. So we don't have to wait until your IB results or A level results or any of those types of scores uh, are completed. We can make a decision uh, well in advance of that. And so what most of us will do is we'll calculate a grade point average. So what we'll do is we'll look at each individual course that you've taken rather than your overall end of year grade. We'll typically look at each individual course you've taken add those up and divide it by the total number of courses and come up with that grade point average um, for a base off of those 9, 10, 11, and any like provisional or predicted scores you might have from 12. We're also um, looking for an upward trend in grades. So yeah. if it's a downward trend, that's not as good as someone whose grades are going up. So we do look at this. So that's a good segue, I think, into one of our final questions. We have three left here of like what the application um, and minimum admission requirements are. Um, so Nathan, do you want to start with that? <clears throat> yeah, so for Westminster College, you know, obviously it depends on the education system uh, that you're in, whether it's the American system, the IB system, the A-level British system, uh, the CBSE system or whatever. CBSE is uh, basically a B2 uh, average um, is kind of what we're looking for or better for minimum admission standards. The higher you score, obviously, the higher scholarship uh, capabilities that there are for you. And there's unlimited numbers of scholarships, as I mentioned before, that range from 9,000, uh, 14,000, 18,000, 21,000, 23,000, and maximum 24,000 that we give off each year. Um, for, a level, uh, for IB, I would say like an average of fives on your IB exams would be the minimum. For us and for A levels, um, typically C or better because a C relates translates to a B average in the U.S. So a C or better in your uh, A less, your AS and A levels, um, and 3.0 GPA if you're on a 4.0 scale, 85 average if you're on a numeric scale. I think uh, Logan, do you want to add to any of that? Uh, yes, ours are pretty similar to what Nathan mentioned. Um, we have um, our IB, if you have a four or above, like our, we want to see an average score or no score lower than a four, I should say. Um, and then as far as um, like general admission, we're looking for that 2.5 GPA. So um, I don't know off the top of my head exactly how that converts into um, CBC, but we're looking for probably like a 70, um, 65 to 70% minimum average across your four years um, or three and a half years, whatever you're able to provide at that time. Um, and then as far as the application goes, we don't require any SATs or ACTs. We are fully test optional um, and we don't require a TOEFL exam either. So we will, um, if you don't submit any proof of English proficiency, we will process your application as a conditional admission and um, we'll have you either take English language courses or take an English language test when you arrive with us here on campus. Um, and then, but yeah, no SAT or ACT is required. Your um, scholarship consideration is solely based off of your high school academics as well. Um, so we're really just looking that when you submit your application that you submit your transcripts. Um, we'll also ask for your application fee. Um, we're on the Common App as well as our own native application. Um, and then uh, we'll ask for a photocopy of your passport um, just so we can verify, uh, match your application with your transcripts and your passport and make sure your Im immigration documents are correct. Um, we did have a quick question here about what the financial amounts are for an I-20. Um, those do vary from school to school, so it depends on um, the, individual, the individual institution that you are um, applying to or that you're applying for that visa for. Um, so for here at K-State, um, like I said, I think it's like 90 or sorry, $37,912 or something along those lines. Um, I always encourage students to kind of make a base or figure off of what they're looking for or the degree program they're going into because it does vary with their um, with the fees for individual colleges here at K-State. Um, but I think it's 37,000, like we chose the minimum number um, for us there to go off of for the I-20 figure. Yeah, and for Westminster College, it would be uh, the 54,163 minus your academic scholarship. If you got our top scholarship of 24,000, that would bring it down to 30,000 that you would need to show. We also have, um, as I mentioned before, we have athletic scholarships. That's very minute, very few people get that. But most of our international students that apply for our, our international grant, which is institutional money that you do not have to pay back, 
it's just an application form. It's a separate application form for that international grant. It's after you've been admitted. And in your acceptance letter, you'll have your academic scholarship will show in your acceptance letter for us. <coughs> so there's a separate international grant that ranges from 1,000 up to 5,000 additional uh, in funding. Like if your family is very close to being able to afford us, but you need like an additional one to five to make it happen, then let's say you got our maximum there, then it'd be about $25,000, you know, it'd be $5,000 uh, international grant that would subtract from your academic scholarship. So that would be about $25,000 total cost um, for us if you got our top scholarship and you got our top international grant for. So um, that's what you have to show in the bank statement, along as with what Logan mentioned, uh, the biographical page, the picture page of your passport that has all the information. And then we have an institutional uh, form called the, um, the I-20 application form. So those three things, we look over them, we make sure the bank statement and everything looks good, and then we issue the I-20 uh, document. We mail that to you, but we only mail them to students who have confirmed their enrollment uh, with us. So because it's very expensive to mail these I-20s out, and um, so we, we usually just do that for students who have confirmed their enrollment with us. We'll, we'll mail it to I-20. And then you have to set up your visa appointment, things like that with U.S. Consul. Um, I don't want to ignore the last part of your question there about some visa tips. Sorry, I forgot that in the beginning part or when I was answering initially. Um, the biggest thing that I can recommend to students is that the, there are two things that I would um, think about. So one, set your expectations when you're going into your visa interview. So typically the interviews, I think the average interview across the world is like maybe three minutes long. So it's not like you're going to sit down, you're going to have a cup of coffee or tea, you're going to kind of go through stuff. It's, it's going to be pretty quick. You know, you're going to be going through, they're going to be trying to get as many people through that window as possible. Um, so set your expectations that it's not going to be you're not going to have the opportunity to kind of lay out your entire life story so um, know what you want to say and be prepared to say it um, the other thing is just be authentic and confident um, so they want to make sure that that you have um, legitimate reasons for choosing to come to the United States and choosing the university that you chose. So I would say just be authentic and confident and say, this is why I chose the university I did. This is why I think it's going to be the best fit for me. And um, just be yourself in the interview, I think. Yeah, relax and also smile. People love to see you smile because they realize, you know, it, it, it's a welcoming uh, thing to smile to someone. You know, when I, you know, I get some of the biggest smiles when I travel around the world with international families and things like that. So just even smiling, but you, you can't just smile and freeze and not know the name of the college or university that you're planning to go to. Make sure you, you know, uh, know exactly, you know, where you're going at, you know, where you're going to be attending and where your uh, acceptance letter is and stuff like that. I know sometimes students freeze when they get in these situations. So you just have to relax and, uh, you know, uh, be yourself, but, but also you have to know, you know, you, you want to know that the common things like, well, you know, plan to stay in America after you, you know, graduate, uh, you might say uh, for, for OPT, but then to come back and help my community here back in India, you know, so you need to, <clears throat> they need to basically know that you're not planning to get married in the U.S. and stay in the U.S. and, uh, and, and work full time, uh, you know, in the U.S., even though Alternatively, that might be something that you're wanting to do. So, uh, but you can't tell them that when you go into the interview. So just kind of know your do's and don'ts of, of that. And you can also, besides um, talking with Kunal as a resource, you can also reach out to Education USA um, as far as visa tips when you go in for that. I think they actually host sessions in every city um, for students who are planning to go to the US. Uh, they have like, um, what's it called, pre-arrival type of you know do's and don'ts for your visa process so I would highly suggest that you look up for your city um, they have all the major cities in India Chennai, Hyderabad, Calcutta you know Delhi, Mumbai they all have, they all have um, Education USA offices so you can reach out to them uh, to get some more specifics of what you should and shouldn't say during a visa And our, oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Luke. I would just say we have one final question there. I didn't want to forget on the student here. Um, so popular clubs for students on campus. For us, um, the Student Governing Association is actually becoming one of the more popular um, organizations that international students are choosing. Um, but of course, we have like your um, 
your religious organizations and cultural organizations, that sort of stuff that students are really um, involved in as well. But um, I think at K-State, it's really difficult to, to name one specific club because we have so many. Um, but um, I have noticed a significant uptick in the number of international students we had represented on our uh, Student Governing Association, which is really exciting to see. Yeah, and for Westminster, I would just say <clears throat> the intramural sports is very popular uh, amongst all our student body. And I would also say like our outdoor recreation club is very popular because of our location. We have all these amazing hiking trails. You can learn to do rock climbing. You can learn to roll uh, roll over in a kayak, you know, like you're, you're doing kayak normally like this way, but you can learn to do like a roll while you're in water. Something I would never try to do, but uh, if you wanted to do that, you could. Uh, they do um, hiking in snowshoes, which are kind of like woven baskets that you attach to your boots, your hiking boots, and they provide all this equipment in their outdoor recreation center. And I guess now they're like plastic or probably Kevlar or whatever. But anyway, you can walk in these uh, snowshoes uh, under the light of moon, under the moonlight. So it's really cool. They do this like, you know, once or twice a semester when it's a full moon, they, they go out with these snowshoes uh, around midnight and they walk around in the snow on, on a trail. And uh, it's, it's really kind of cool. But there's lots of clubs and every student has their own interest as far as like what they would or wouldn't want to do. Great, thank you so much to the panelists. Before I come online, uh, uh, you know, to say goodbye on video, I think there was one question that we forgot. I know we're over time, but uh, you know, I'd really appreciate it. I think the email addresses someone had asked, if you can just put them in the chat box, I think that will be really oh. helpful. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna run a quick poll to everyone. Uh, and then of course, I'm gonna be on just to say goodbye and uh, conclude our, our session for the day. Thank you. The poll on your screen is, did you find this session useful? I hope so. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. I think it went really, really well. Um, yeah, I think it went really well. I'm just going to end it real quick because I think we're now past the 30 second mark. Um, just kindly give me one second. Yes, and I've uh, shared the results. Uh, basically, everyone is saying yes. So thank you so much to everyone who has attended. I'd also like to take a special thanks to uh, uh, both Mr. Logan and Mr. Nathan uh, from you know Kansas State University and Westminster College accordingly. It's very early in the morning out there, guys. I think it's about 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So thank you so much uh, for your kind time and support. It's 7.30, I think uh, Mr. Nathan was saying, uh, for you know sharing some very useful uh, information, not only about your institution, but also about your regions and your cities and your communities uh, from there. And um, yes, we definitely look forward to keeping in touch with you. As I've shared earlier, the Knowledge at KPD Admissions 101 series is recorded and is shared with high schools all across India. So we will be putting these recorded sessions on all our pages and will be shared with uh, everyone else in the community. So for those who are not able to join today, uh, obviously can view this at the comfort of their home uh, once the session is over. And I just want to uh, thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Logan, for uh, you know being the empowered panelists today. And if all the attendees can come forward and just uh, uh, thank them as well. So thank you so much uh, for all your time and support today. Thank you all. Thank you all, everybody. Have thank great you. Great thank evening. you. Wish you all a wonderful day, and we look forward to keeping in touch with you. Thank you once again. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you. Good day. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.